and welcome to the Student Empowerment through SEL in Music Education webinar series. Thank you for being here for episode three, SEL for Equity and Vitality through Music Education. My name is Rebecca Hoff from Save the Music Foundation. Save the Music is proud to partner with the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning to produce this free webinar series. Lastly, this work was made possible through the support of KKR COVID Response Fund, a sponsored project of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. We thank them for making this possible. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our facilitator for today's episode, Dr. Yurel Lashley, Director of Student Empowerment for the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And welcome to our audience today, and especially to our, our very special guests, Dr. Connie McCoy and Mickey Smith Jr. Our conversation tonight will explore creating spaces for music education that really support student vitality, equity, and joy toward student empowerment, as well as to share models for making those social and emotional outcomes intentional, embedded, and sustained routines in learning community practices. So, now to our guest, Dr. Connie McCoy is, is the Marion Stedman Covington Distinguished Presser, Professor, I should say, and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the School of Music at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in music education. A native of Fayetteville, North Carolina, she holds a Bachelor of Music degree from Oberlin, Oberlin Conservatory of Music and earned both master's and PhD degrees in music education from UNCG. For 19 years, she served as a lead teacher, general music teacher, and school choral director. And Dr. Connie McCoy's research focuses on music teachers' cross-cultural competence and culturally responsive teaching in music. She co-authored the book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in Music Education. From Understanding to Application, published by Rutledge. In 2017 and 2019, Dr. McCoy participated in the Yale Symposium on Music in Schools. She is a past president of the North Carolina Music Educators Association and a past chair of the Society for Music Teacher Education. Mickey Smith Jr. is the Educator Encourager and was named the Grammy Music Educator Award national recipient for 2020. As an educator encourager, Mickey provides a, a motivational mixture of education and entertainment. Mickey currently teaches music grades one through eight at the Green School in West Palm Beach, Florida. Mickey's Sound 180 Educators is an online community dedicated to helping all teachers succeed over frustration and fatigue and creating a, a sound 180 days of classroom music instruction and harmony. Mickey helps educators focus on self-management and mental health, classroom management and student behavior. Our initial questions for our distinguished guests this evening are the following. Where do you see natural connections between arts education, social and emotional development, vitality and equity, and how might these be opportunities to support students through music education? And then, how do you see this living in your own work, research and practice? Further, what are some examples that you might share from your work that you have used or seen that were effective? So we asked each of our guests to try and address these questions and we've, we've given them about a few minutes to just sort of preface and, and ground their work around them. So first we'll start with Dr. McCoy and I'll invite you to start us off and remind our audience to, re to, to do use the Q&A feature to share ideas and questions as those bubble up for you. Dr. McCoy. Thank you, Dr. Lashley. And um, I just wanna start out by saying thanks to the Save the Music Foundation and the Center for Arts Ed and Social Emotional Learning for inviting me to be a part of this webinar this evening. Um, the topic is uh, relevant and timely, and uh, I look forward to the discussions we're going to have this evening. Um, as I think about the questions that form the focus of uh, the webinar, I want to start out with a, a, a quote that I ran across several years ago. Actually, I was sitting on a plane 
uh, reading one of the airline magazines and they had uh, an article in it by Kurt Vonnegut, who some of you may remember uh, had written some science fiction uh, novels, uh, probably the most well-known was Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, but there was a quote that he had in it that really uh, struck me. And I think it's a, a good place to begin in talking about the natural connections that I see between arts education and social and emotional development in terms of, of benefits for students. And this, this is the quote. He said, I always say to people, practice an art, no matter how well or badly, because then you have the experience of becoming and it makes your soul grow. That just really struck me and resonated with me for a couple of reasons. One is that it seems to focus on the importance of music as a means of personal individual expression. Um, one of my beliefs about music education is that it shouldn't just be about interpreting through performance what others have composed or what has already been composed, though that experience can be incredibly impactful for people. But when students have the chance to create their own music, to express their musicality in a full range of ways, or to perform music that has relevance for their own lives, that experience can be both powerful and empowering. And as I think about the connections between what I am coming to understand about social emotional learning um, and arts education, I feel that the thing that really connects both of those things is this idea of empowering students and this idea of enabling them to harness the creative power within themselves to express themselves, to understand that, that that's a birthright and that um, they all have, everybody has the power to be creative um, in whatever area uh, they might feel that they have uh, uh, an interest in. And so I think that that, that particular quote uh, is, is important and it, and it resonates with me a lot when I think about some of the connections that we have, the things that we're trying to do with students um, in our work with them as music educators and also as arts educators. Um, one of the things that I have tried to do in my own work, uh, as far as this goes, is uh, to bring in or to, to look at the work that I do as a music educator and as a music teacher educator uh, through the lens of culturally responsive teaching. Um, as I consider the question here in terms of connections between the outline competencies of social emotional learning, and the potential of application in, in the areas of arts education in general and music education in particular, I see additional significance of viewing this intersection within the framework of culturally responsive teaching. And here's why. Um, if as um, arts ed sale proposes, engaging artistic processes can further develop competencies then the, the competencies in social emotional learning, then we can also see how engaging music making and music creating that has cultural significance and relevance for individuals can also contribute to the enhancement of the competencies that are associated with social emotional learning. And this is because culturally responsive teaching calls upon us as music educators to learn how our students' lived cultural experiences have shaped them musically as well as individually and to assist them in achieving their musical goals. One of the things I have um, started doing, I guess, when I present to people and when I talk to teachers is to really ask them, have you ever asked your students what their musical goals are? Um, we tend to approach our teaching um, focusing primarily on curriculum, which may be um, framed within uh, state standards or national standards, and sometimes even district standards. And those are important. But I think it's also important to, to think about what are our students' musical goals? 
if we uh, approach teaching them, when we have no idea what they want to accomplish musically, either in the present or in the future, then I think we're missing a big, uh, a big opportunity to make the kinds of connections with students that will enable them to not only grow musically, but also to uh, develop the competencies that will help them to navigate a variety of environments, which is something that um, social and emotional learning uh, purports to do. So I think it's really important for us to, to think about our role, that, that part of our role as music educators is to help students achieve their musical goals. It's a significant aspect of it. And I, I encourage people to think about that a bit uh, as often as they can, um, especially when they first meet their students. Uh, getting to know what their students' musical goals are can be very enlightening for us. And it can also serve as a, a, a foundation for the preparation of the kind of instruction that we plan for our students. In terms of the question about what some of the examples are of these kinds of connections between arts education and social and emotional learning, and I would also connect in uh, culturally responsive teaching, uh, I want to share uh, actually three stories with you. Um, one is it actually came from an interview that my colleague, uh, a co-writer, a co-author, um, Vicki Lind and I uh, encountered when we were interviewing teachers for our book. Um, this particular teacher uh, was a string music educator. She taught in an arts, elementary arts magnet school whose uh, population of students was primarily African-American. And she was in, the, the school was named after a, a gentleman named Abraham Peeler, who was an African-American educator in the Greensboro, North Carolina era, uh, area during uh, the 1940s and 50s. And she was curious to know who this person was. And so she did some research um, at the local archives. And what she found out, uh, among other things, was that Abraham Peeler played the violin. And so she shared this information with her students and talked about um, his love of the violin, talked about his um, work as an uh, ed African-American educator. And when she finished telling her students about this man, they said, well, oh, we're a part of history. And making that connection with her students between um, themselves as um, string students um, and Abraham Peeler, who is the person that their school is named after and the fact that he played violin was a way for her to establish our foundation, uh, uh, building a foundational relationship with her students that I think served her well or has served her well as she has worked with them. Making that connection with them that I think was so significant um, meant that she saw them much saw them as being much more than just her string students, but she saw them as students who um, would benefit from seeing the connection between themselves, their school, and the history and of the achievements of, of Abraham Peeler. Um, the second story I, I wanted to share as an example of where I've seen what I think are intersections between um, the connections of arts, education, social emotional learning, and uh, culturally responsive teaching um, relates to a high school band director who had previously taught English as a second language in a high school um, that where the school population was predominantly Mexican. But he, he had a music background. He um, actually had studied and gotten his, his uh, undergraduate degree in music performance. And so he had been asked by the principal if he might be interested in, in becoming the band director there because they'd had a lot of different directors come through. And he agreed to do that. And uh, But his approach was very different from the traditional uh, approach that you would often see in high school bands. And uh, his approach was a bit more modular. 
It was one where students could learn the instruments that were of interest to them, create their own groups, develop independence to perform at events in their communities. Um, he had a large guitar class. And one of the things he focused on in his work with them um, was uh, music that had relevance and meaning for them. Um, he was able to, to help them, by doing this, he was able to help them develop the musical skills they needed to achieve their musical goals. Um, and it gave them the kind of autonomy and independence that I think reflects actually all five of the social emotional learning competencies um, and uh, enables our students. I, I've often thought in terms of uh, music education, our objective actually is to become obsolete. <laughs> we want our students to be able to do things without us. And I think that's a great, there's a great example of empowerment in, in that story. Um, and I was, I thought about a third story, but I don't want to um, over, over, go over my time. But I think that um, in, in mentioning these um, areas of a connection between arts education and social emotional learning, um, looking at all of that within the framework of culturally responsive teaching and giving you a few examples of where I've seen this uh, applied in my own work and in my interactions with um, teachers. Uh, I, I hope I give you some indication of my perspective of, of how important and significant all of this is. All right, thank you so much, Dr. McCoy. Um, I, you've given us quite a bit to chew on in thinking just about, uh, for example, SEL and sort of empowering students and, and personal creative power being a critical connection between music ed and SEL. Um, and obviously asking students what their musical goals are. And then even thinking about the, and that, Abraham Peeler's story, I hear just the importance of lineage, which is something that is near and dear to my heart as someone who does non-Western music with students. So thank you for that. All right, now we turn to hearing from our other guests, Mickey Smith Jr. Welcome to the discussion and we're anxious to hear how you think about those three ideas. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lashley and Dr. McCoy. Uh, those words are so powerful uh, as you shared, not only just the personal experience, but being able to give us some windows into um, opportunities that we ourselves can see SEL in our daily practices. I think it's so important. Um, you know, for me, I, I always think our role as an educator is simply to answer questions and to add value. Um, I think the biggest question we have that faces our classrooms each and every day is this, <laughs> knock, knock, who's there? I am, I am who? And really it comes down to that at the end of the day. Everything that comes next after that question is the value. I am who, our kids literally come into our classrooms, not just wanting to know about subject matter, but really what they wanna know is, do they matter? It, it, we can't be so caught up on the instruction that we miss the significance of the individual. And that's why this discussion is so powerful today because we're talking about equity. We're talking about vitality but we're talking about identity at the end of the day. Do we see our students? I believe equity yields significance and significance is so significant. It's so important in this season. We hear over and over and time and time again, folks wanna know that they matter. And I think that that comes down to a level of understanding that I am significant in this moment. And music provides that powerful medium for us to show a level of significance in the lives of our young people, in the lives of our educators, in the lives of everybody that makes up this thing called humanity. I think vitality yields perseverance. And when you have perseverance and you have significance, you have a powerful combination that literally can change lives and can change generations. None of us are special, but all of us are significant. Those are the words I tell my students when we first meet. And boy, I, get, I go for the shock value. There's nothing like looking in a room full of wonderful young people and telling them, none of you are special. But I quickly follow that up with, but each of you are significant. And it begins to open up that, that dialogue, that understanding of, okay, what, what do those words really mean? I, I always have that image of Lady uh, Justice, you know, when she's got the scales and she's blindfolded. I think equality is blind. 
But equity has perspective. Equity sees. It recognizes each person has a different circumstance and it allocates that exact uh, resource or, or those opportunities that are needed for those individuals to reach their highest point, to reach an equal destination, an equal outcome. And in my classroom, there are two questions that are asked at the beginning of the school day, at the beginning of the school year. I believe in a program that I share called First Days Lasting Ways, because so much of teaching music has nothing to do with music. It has everything with setting the culture and the climate in that classroom for learning, for people being comfortable making mistakes, because we all know music is just a bunch of failure and done over and over again until you reach that beautiful outcome transforming that noise into something beautiful called music. But how do you create that climate where people are vulnerable and they're transparent and they're authentic? Well, it, for me, it starts with two questions. I simply say, kids, will I treat everyone fairly? And in my little PowerPoint, the next slide says yes, in big letters. And everybody's pretty comfortable. Everybody's like, that, that makes sense. But then in the next slide I show, it asks the question, will I treat everyone the same? And the very next slide in huge letters says no. And I got to be honest with you, there's not one year that's gone by that when that big no shows up, there's not personal offense. You hear people gasping, oh, I knew it. And you hear him whispering, I knew he was going to be mean <laughs> for, the new, for the new students. It, it, it really shocks them. But what it does, it provides me a, a springboard, an opportunity for me to show them what significance means. See, equity says, I see you. I see you and I'm going to I'm going to respond to you as you are not with this blanket cookie cutter idea of what can be, but what should be because you are significant. I'll say it again. No one is special, but all of us are significant. And I think music provides that opportunity for us to do that. It's a it's a it's a powerful, dynamic and universal vehicle that can literally bypass the brain and go straight to the heart. There's not many things in this thing called life that have that type of power that can do it. But music is that thing that can do it. It, 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 it. it has the power to create and cultivate relationship in a powerful way between teacher and student. Now, some of it's because, let's just be honest, <laughs> we spend more time with them than the average teacher. And that's no disrespect to you know my core curriculum out there that may be listening and watching today. But for the most part, you might get them one year. But when you're the music teacher, when you're the art teacher, when you're the movement teacher, I call it the core, uh, I call us the encore. When you part of the encore click, man, you, we have them for multiple years. So we see a level of development and we also have an opportunity to pour into them in a way that allows our relationships to build and grow in, in an incredibly dynamic way. And with that comes opportunities to develop SEL. With that comes opportunities for students to develop an identity based on a sound adult that sees a little bit more than they can see. I really do believe every child is one sound adult away from discovering the sound of success. But when I say the sound, we'll talk more about it today. I'm not necessarily talking about the audible. I'm talking about the internal, that significance that each of us carries, that significance that has the ability to resonate or even repel students. That's why it's so important, as Dr. McCoy said earlier, that we take time to hear them, that we are students of the students. And that we're not so much a student of the subject matter that we forget to show the students that they actually matter, that this whole thing is really about them. Because if it's not about them, then it's not about anything. Because at the end of the day, they got, they got access to more information on this phone than they had when, when the folks landed the first person on the moon. They don't really need us for information. They need us for relationship. They need us for that. Why? Because modern day teaching is relationship-based teaching. You can't get around it. And, and, and I believe that a classroom that says through actions and deeds, I see you is the ultimate mark of a great classroom. I think it's so important, guys. I think it's, it's so important because it's, it's fundamentally human when we can provide opportunities that say, I see you through music. Now, why do I say it's fundamentally human? Because I think music is fundamental to the human experience. It's the only thing that we have that is universally accepted. It's the universal language. That's why I said it literally has the capacity to bypass the brain and go straight to the heart. I don't even have to speak the same language you speak, but through music, we can feel the same thing. And, and that person that may be from a generation ago or a generation to come, we can all find common ground 
through something as powerful and as simple and as universal as music. That's why I think as music educators, now more than ever, we have to reach into our toolbox and find ways to engage students on a powerful level. We learned it during COVID. I mean, back in the day before, I call it BC before COVID, BC before COVID, you know, sometimes, you know, admin would say, hey, it's benchmarks and standards. We got to get the benchmarks and standards. And if, if, if you had to sacrifice the engagement, you did that to get to the benchmarks, to get to the standards, to get ready for that assessment. But then something crazy happened. We had this pandemic that put us all in the Brady Bunch grids. We were all in the Zooms and the Google Meets and all these different things. And all of a sudden now, <laughs> it became painfully clear that if you didn't have engagement, you never reached the benchmarks and the standards. Because if they didn't feel loved, valued, and wanted, and connected, not only would they mute, but they never turned on the screen. So how do you teach someone who's not there? I think it's so important that we do more than teach, that we reach, that we do more than instruct, that we inspire, and SEL provides that opportunity. You don't have to have a bunch of research. You just have to be there. And be there in such a way that shows, I see you. And, and part of how I do that in my classroom, there's some powerful resources I use. One is, is from a gentleman uh, who, 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 who partners a, a group called Lessons for SEL, and he has these, these safe circles and these restorative practice uh, guidelines. And, and I follow these, and, and I try to make conversation builders because, believe it or not, I'm a recovering introvert. I'm very comfortable on the on the platform of a social media or virtually, but sometimes I, I, I'm as just as nervous as anybody else starting some of these conversations and curtailing them to where they don't compromise the instruction. But through resources such as this, I can manage it and I can create these these moments of spontaneity. I call it planned spontaneity in my classroom to where the kids come in, and they, they, they get to know not only do I get to play today, but I get to be seen, I get to be heard. And at the end of the day, those are the classrooms we love the most. And when we think about the teachers we love the most, we remember the ones that made us feel as though we were there, as though we were significant. There's nothing, there's no thing more fundamentally, fundamentally uh, human than this thing called music. And there's nothing more fundamentally important than significance, knowing that we matter. But the significance alone is not it. Yes, yes, we want to have the significance, we want to have the equity, but the vitality, I believe, yields perseverance. And in this season, so to speak, that we're in, I think everybody could stand to have a little perseverance. I think, I think perseverance is going to be the thing that carries us through. It's also the tool that, that helps us to keep on going. It's a powerful tool, not only because it's, it's a, a byproduct of vitality, but also because it's the pathway between potential and promise. You know, I tell everybody that I get opportunity to speak to that there's nothing special about potential. Everybody has it. Matter of fact, I was on a show uh, many, many years ago called America's Got Talent. And I, it became painfully obvious as I stood in line <laughs> what the title meant. It literally means there's nothing special about talent. Everybody has a measure of talent. But very few people persevere and push through from that point of potential to that place of promise. That place of promise is the significance realized. And our students deserve to have that opportunity to realize not just the potential, but the promise that they have in this thing called life. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, I think is wrapped up in this thing called promise. But the promise is only reached on this pathway called perseverance. If you could get that image in your mind's eye of this pathway, and literally the street name is called perseverance, but so few people take that journey all the way. I believe music provides that opportunity. Why? Because can you think of anything else <laughs> that develops perseverance quite the same way that music does? You don't just pick up this instrument and start playing it. There's no th such thing as overnight success. There's over life success in this thing called music. And the crazy thing about music, and I know so many of you will agree with me, is that the kids work harder on the music than sometimes they do in the other subjects, not even realize they're working harder because music has that powerful way to keep you working, but it also fuels your heart, your mind, and your soul in the process. I don't have all the specs on it. I don't even profess to be able to quantify it fully. I just know what I know, and I know what I've seen, and I know what others say, that music is our modern day tool for allowing young people and young at heart to not only realize their significance, 
but to exercise the perseverance that will lead them to the promise. It's going to help you more than you realize. And as educators, I believe it's, it's our duty to show these young people, not just the significance that music holds or the significance that we hold in their lives, maybe as a, a trusted sound adult, but ultimately the significance that they have. But how do you do that? I want to remind you today that every child that comes in your classroom has on two backpacks. <laughs> every child that comes into our classroom has two backpacks. They got one backpack you can see, and they got a whole nother bad boy that's invisible. But watch this. In order to teach them, we have to unpack both. That's the power of SEL. You show me a classroom that achieves, I'm going to show you one that believes. I'm going to show you one that has a, a perspective and a mindset that is built on equity and vitality, significance and perseverance. They just built different. How many times have we heard that the band students, that the orchestra students, that the, that the choir students, that they just different in a good way? How many times do we see that they get accepted into the college or they get the opportunities that some others don't get? Why? It's not because that they're special. Come on now. It's because they're significant. They've been significantly impacted. Why? Because they had a sound adult that used this powerful medium called music. But most importantly, that sound adult had a perspective that told them that this is not about the instruction alone. This is about the individual. You cannot put the instruction before the individual. Why? Because it's all about trying. Now, when you say try, you may say T-R-Y, but I say T-R-I-I. -I. Why? Because trust opens up the door to relationship from relationship opens up the door to influence from influence then opens the door to instruction why because we learn better from people we trust we learn better from people we like and who doesn't like music <laughs> the game is rigged i'm telling you today if we just use this powerful medium we have not only do can we give them something that they all know and love but we can be someone that they too know and love oh music it's the tool but it's also the ally as well I, I need you to understand the significance of trust in this season. SEL is that powerful action verb. It's that powerful opportunity. And it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to answer the call each and every day and do so authentically, transparently. Do so truthfully. Why? Because trust is at the center of it all. I think, I think when we talk about trust, trust changes the way we see the world. See, I believe that there's really two perspectives for any lifelong learner. Notice I didn't say teacher, I said lifelong learner. For any lifelong learner that's interested in developing SEL, I think you have to look through both the mirror and the window. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. See, see, perspective in this thing called life has to have a certain level of balance. We have to, we have to be able to look at situations and relationships, situations, relationships, situationships in a way that that allows us to grow and most importantly the ones around us to grow too because in order to add value to others we have to see value first in ourselves and then in those that we teach you know I, i'm gonna be honest with you some of the most difficult uh situations i've been in is trying to teach people that didn't quite look like me or sound like me or come from the same background i came from that was a challenge and as tempting as it is to look through the window First, I had to look through the mirror. So SEL is not always an outward thing. Sometimes it starts with me. <laughs> Lauren Hill said it back in the day, how you going to win if you ain't right within? I think first it starts with us looking within because you can't change the world until you start with yourself. SEL is not just something we give, but it's something we give ourselves. It's something we get each and every day. Every day. We should have balance between mirrors and windows. And I challenge my students in our class to do the same thing. We do it in music. We, do, we talk about balance in our ensembles. We say things like, if you can't hear the person next to you more than you hear yourself, maybe you're out of balance. We talk about blend. We talk about all these things that create ensemble, that create community. So why is it so hard to do SEL? I don't think it is. I think it's just using music as a mirror for everything that is life so that we can look out the window of life and see it a little bit more clear, a little bit more, dare I say, ensemble-ish. There's something so powerful about this medium called music. And if we do it right, not only do we create a sound musically, but I think we become sound, but sound is an acronym. 
when I talk about sound, it comes down to five things. And I, I conclude with this every day. I like to do a sound check and I have a, I have a, a, a little quality quadrant that I operate with every day. And I, I literally write down, this is my SEL to start the day. I literally write down the vision for my day as an educator. I'm not perfect. I'm just humanity on display, no different than anyone else. But with every day I make a, I make the marked choice to say, I will greet this day with love in my heart. I will great this day. I will great this day with love in my heart. I will make it great. And one thing that I do is I try to actionably, intentionally write down how I'm going to be S-O-U-N-D. C-S stands for see yourself beyond yourself. So every day I write down, how am I going to see myself beyond myself? How am I not going to get caught up with the mirror? Because so, see, sometimes the mirror is good. Like to get ready for the day, it's good. But we walking around with the mirror all day, that's a little weird. I'm just saying. <laughs> You're not going to make many friends looking at the mirror all day. At some point, you got to look through the window. You have to see something beyond yourself. So I may do that by, by making a point to, to engage someone I wouldn't have engaged before. To, to look at the perspective of someone that, that maybe is different than me and, and have empathy in a way that maybe I haven't. And I write that down so that I'm intentional about it. O stands for operating optimism and excellence daily. You know, that it could be a number of things. Somebody says, is that, is that, is that fake it till you make it? Is that faith it till you make it? I think it's face it till you make it. I think it's, I think it's stepping out and understanding that I have all the tools necessary to win in this day. To matter of fact, to make every day a Wednesday, W I N S every day can be a Wednesday, but I have to be that thermostat as opposed to the thermometer that just reacts. And let's not get it twisted. I've reacted some time too. I'm just, I'm just an imperfect person, but I make a point each and every day to try to operate in a perfected manner. And, and, and by doing that, not only am I SO, but I also put myself in a position to you utilize all available resources. See, see, by doing these things, I become the model and not just the mirror. I become the model for what my students see. It's nothing special about me, but there is something significant about me. And they say at all times, you know, that we should teach, but I think we teach at all times, but when necessary, use words. I let my sound speak before my sound is heard. What am I talking about? S-O-U-N, nourishing relationships. I believe it's so important that we pour into others, but we also have to pour into ourselves. That's why this is so significant that we that we look through the lens of love, that we look through the lens of SEL, that we that we see, because it's one thing to SEL and it's one thing to SET, but there's one thing to SEE, that's social emotional experience. Can I create an experience of both learning and teaching? Can I create an experience that lasts for a lifetime? Because when you think of your favorite teacher and you close your eyes, you think of the way they made you feel when you're in their presence before you think of anything they taught. That relationship is so significant. And if you do those four things, then just naturally, I'm here, to tell, I'm here today to tell you that you're going to be in the D quadrant. Don't stop, keep on going. It's something amazing that when we are sound, it creates, it creates the fuel and it definitely ignites the passion for us to go through the difficult things. I'm gonna be the first one to tell you that things are tough, but I'll also be the first to tell you that so are you. Things are tough, but so are you. This is the message that we that we accept, that we receive, that we model, and hopefully that we give our students agency to operate, to belong, and to just be and identify in a way where they understand I am loved, I'm valued, I'm wanted, but most importantly, I am significant and I am vital. I have the vitality. I have the perseverance to win, to keep going so that one day the seeds that we sow as teachers will then be taken by those students and they'll sow them into others. This is how I see the classroom. I see it more as a stage where our sound is shared with an audience called our students so that they in turn can be the sound to change the world. All right, thank you, Mickey Smith. Um, I may look a little different now. I had a little computer issue. <laughs> My one machine crashed, so I had to switch in the middle. You never know what's going on in the in the background for these sorts of situations. In any event, I want to thank both of our panelists. Um, 
And now we want to get into some questions that are a bit more focused. Nikki, you gave us a lot to think about and thinking about, uh, you know, looking through the mirror and the window, but also answering the call every day and, and not feeling like answering the call means always having all the answers and also the importance of modeling and, and that being in the music class can be a, a place of promise. So I think these are solid foundations that we've gotten for both of you around how to think about a lot of this work. So we'll, I'm gonna jump to some questions that actually came in from participants first, and then we'll double back to some other questions that we may have for you too. I think for Connie, somebody was really interested in thinking about how to explore relevance. And I guess that means essentially culturally relevance or culturally sustaining practices and meaning. And then when that might be the background <clears throat> I guess it says when this, when, 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 essentially when teachers have, are coming from different backgrounds and students. So some, some basic ideas around how to sort of explore that, but really to create a space where, where that kind of recognition um, and student derived focus can live. A, a start. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just, could you, can you say that again? I wasn't really following that question very easily. Well, basically, how, how do we go about, especially as, as in the case where we have teachers who are, are teaching students who have different cultural identities and backgrounds and experiences, yeah. how do we go about creating a space where it really is culturally relevant in a sustained way um, and culturally sustaining as well? I think a lot of this has to do with uh, uh, focusing in on students, finding out about your students, finding out, for example, what music means to them. Uh, if we're talking about, you know, specifically the music context, you know, what kind of music do they listen to? What does music mean to them? I go back to what I said about finding out what their musical goals are, getting to know, and, and there's a lot of, one of the things, this may be getting kind of off point a little bit, but it's something I think needs to be maybe mentioned is that, you know, when I, I when I was first asked to participate in this webinar, one of the first things that I um, said was uh, social emotional learning is not my area. My area is culturally responsive teaching. And then I, it was explained to me that they actually wanted to hear that what that connection is between culturally responsive teaching and social emotional learning. And in preparation for this webinar, I started doing a bit of, of reading about social emotional learning. And one of the things that I found is that sometimes the focus on social emotional learning is, is just on what students need to do. And one of the things that uh, Mickey said that I thought was so important is like looking at yourself in terms of social emotional learning. And so in answering that question about how do we support and validate students um, individual cultural identities, I for me the first step is turning inward and looking at yourself and looking at your own um, values and attitudes and how we see students, um, and, and their behaviors, especially the behaviors that may be culturally different from what we're accustomed to. And I bring that up because in some, in some places, social emotional learning is only about regulating behavior because there are students that are perceived as being difficult to manage or uh, behavior problems. And that is a, I think um, those who are who are well versed in social emotional learning would say that that's sort of a, if I can use the term bastardiz bastardization of what social emotional learning really is. And so it's a two way street. And so for teachers to be able to sustain and validate um, th the various cultural identities that their their students um, relate to and reflect uh, begins with looking at yourself and thinking about, you know, how do I feel about this? How do I feel about working with, with kids who are, who are different from me and understanding that we all have 
have things to learn uh, when it comes to that and not being afraid to make mistakes. I think it was um, Maya Angelou who said, um, do the best you can. And when you know better, do better. So everybody's doing the best they can. They can't know everything and you're gonna make mistakes and you can't be afraid of that. You, you're gonna slip up, you're gonna offend somebody sometimes. Um, even it, particularly, I think this is difficult for people who are really trying, you know, people that don't really care if they offend anybody, that's no problem for them. But for people who are really trying to, to teach in ways that are culturally that are responsive to culture and that acknowledge the importance of trying to sustain culture when they offend that's really uh, hurtful it's hard for them because that's not their intention they don't want people to think that they're the kind of people that would run around offending people and I, I think that you have to kind of you have to sit with it I won't say get over it because it's hard but you have to sit with it and understand that in, in this process of, of navigating, working with a var wide variety of students, um, there, there may be some moments when you make mistakes, but that's, that's when you learn. None of us learn how to walk without falling down. So, you know, I would say just be willing to, and, and, and take, you can take baby steps. It doesn't, I think sometimes people might feel a little overwhelmed about uh, trying to be more responsive to your students, but it can take, you can be small things that you do that, but if you just make a commitment to try to employ approaches in your teaching that are more um, uh, responsive to culture, more responsive to the social and emotional development of your students, I think you can, you, you, you can be effective. Thank you for that. And you made me also think about the reality that even the even the making of mistakes and then owning them for students is a modeling of some important things that we want to cultivate, especially in a space where everybody is taking a risk to learn, right? If, if we're all making mistakes together, then I think as educators, when we admit that, then it doesn't just humanize us it actually humanizes the process that we're in charge of trying to lead for students. So thank Absolutely. you for that. You know, I, I, I think, you know, it goes back to what you said, small things done well, stacked on top of each other. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, this situation that our kids find themselves in, that society even finds itself in, didn't happen overnight. No one person is going to fix it in one fatal swoop. Um, you know, but, but I think that folks say it all the time, do it for the culture, but do it for the kid. Do it for the kid first, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes, it, look, it, we, we just being real today. Sometimes we so woke, maybe we need to take a nap sometime. I'm just beyond some folks like we, we sometimes we can be doing too much. And what happens is you can con a con, you can fool a fool, but you can't kid a kid. And and sometimes if, if you're doing too much, you know, not for the sake of the child, the child sees it and has an adverse reaction. So I would say, you know, when, when, if your heart's in the right place, make sure that your eyes are looking at the child first and meet the child where they're at. I'm gonna be honest, I've been in those situations. Uh, I'm currently in a school now where very few people look like me at this school. And, and what I have to do is I have to take those steps to, to find out what the culture is. And the culture is not just the ethnicity, it's how they do things in that region of the country. It's going to their their football games, their basketball games, just doing stuff outside the classroom and seeing how they interact and and what they do as children and as families, you know, outside of that classroom, because you're going to see a whole nother kid outside the classroom. And that's that's powerful. That's that's good intel. That's so important. It gives you another spectrum, another perspective of who that who that family is, who that child is. And it allows you to put something else in your toolbox that you can use to reach that child in the time that's necessary. And, and, and yes, will you learn some things culturally? Absolutely. But you'll learn about the individual, just like with the teaching. I think the individual comes first. And as you learn about the individual, watch this. After a while, they'll begin telling you things that you didn't even ask for. You won't have to hunt and fish for it because kids, once they once they like you, they start giving you way too much information. I'm just saying they go tell you everything about their mom and them, their grandma, their pappy, their dad, everybody. After a while, you're going to be like, look, I, I, I got enough information. So for those folks that are out there, I would say be careful not to do too much. You know, have your heart in the right place. 
and keep your focus on the child and everything else is going to come along with it. Absolutely. Thank you. So another question we have is, as and we see this often in music education, right? We know that students come in with different needs in different developmental places, but also just in different places and even interacting with a musical experience or even an instrument. And so the question really is, especially since students often want things to, to feel equal or get the same exact experience as someone else. And Mickey, you spoke to this a little bit about trying to uh, make sure that <clears throat> that what we want is is equity, which really means actually getting at what what students individually need. But the question is just sort of how do you how do you communicate to students that essentially there will be times when certain students need different things and that those needs will be fulfilled as best they can by an educator. And maybe that won't be exactly equal, but everybody gets what's needed. So sort of how do you how do you lay that that groundwork at the door? Like the moment they get there, they ain't got anything to do with music, man. I'm glad to see you here today, man. Hey, hey I've been waiting for you all day. See, it really don't even matter if, if you may literally be the only person that has said that child's name that day. You know, they might have got up and their mama might have been, boy, get out of here. And, you know, a uh, girl, hush. And they may have never called them by their name. They may have got on the bus. Nobody spoke to them. They may have got off the bus, walked into the school, and they fussed at them about their uniform, their attire, never calling them by their name. Sometimes just saying somebody's name or just watch this. Here's something. You're a revolutionary. Eye contact. Sometimes, sometimes you just look them in the eye and smile. I always like to say, I'm not feeling it every day, but I notice if I act enthusiastic, I'll be enthusiastic. And one thing about that enthusiasm is contagious. So, so what I'm saying is by the time they get in the door, I've already made a deposit such to where not only can I make withdrawals during class, okay, if I got to go in and, hey, hey, go sit down, go do, I've made enough deposits. Now I can make a withdrawal, but most importantly, I've made that initial deposit so that everybody, by the time they sit down, they feel like they already got something. I'm already winning. And even if they don't quite get hot cross buns that day, or they don't quite hit the three octave scale, they know, man, I, I, I may have not got what I wanted, but I know Mr. Smith's proud of me. I know I, I belong in this place because, man, did you see the way he was? Like, he, he dapped me up when I came in the room. Literally, everything that has everything to do with music has no thing to do with music. It's all about relational. It's relationship. And I think that sometimes we get so deep, we forget about the basic human element that comes first. I think that's what you do. You just meet, meet them where they're at and you show them that they're, they're there and you show them that you care. One of the things that came to mind for me with that question too is uh, I, I, I heard, I think I heard a, a question about how do we help our students understand the difference between equality and equity. And I ran across uh, this blog by a teacher named Laura David. She's a kindergarten teacher. And she taught her kids about the difference between equity and equality in a really simple way. She got the kids in a circle and she asked uh, each one of them to give her their shoe. And she threw it in the center of the circle. And then she picked up the shoes and distributed them randomly to every child and asked them to put the shoes on. And um, immediately there were you know, there were cries of consternation because my shoe doesn't fit, my shoe too big, my shoe too small. But this, we can't do it, we can't deal with this. And she said, Well, what's the matter? Well, I, I can't wear my shoe. She said, Well, what's the problem? All of you have a shoe, right? But it doesn't fit. It's like, well, if if I if I give you a shoe that, you know, I can't give everybody something they can't use. Everybody has a shoe. Yeah, that's equal. Every everybody's got what 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 they uh, what they everybody has the same thing. And then so she pretended like she didn't understand what they were saying. And then finally, as they said, but we need the shoe that fits us. And then she said, oh, so it really doesn't matter that you have a shoe. What matters is that you have the shoe that fits you. And they were able and that's something by doing that, she was able to help them understand, you know, equality is everybody getting a shoe, but equity is you get the shoe that fits you. You get what you need. 
And it was just such a wonderfully simple but significant and profound way of explaining the difference. And, you know, if kindergartners can get it, you know, anybody can get it because kindergartners actually are very profound people, but we don't have time to talk about how profound kindergartners are. Um, but yeah, I think I think um, a lot of times students do have a, a difficult time because they're, they've always been exposed to this notion of equality and not treating anybody any different from somebody else. Um, and, and Mickey addressed this too uh, in, when he was talking in his opening statements. Uh, and it was so wonderful the, the, the ways in which he um, engage with students at the beginning and sort of the shock value that comes with not get them not seeing the answer that they're anticipating. And I think that when we look at equity and equality, it's that same kind of thing that kids are sort of raised on this notion of equality, but they don't quite get how significant and important equity is, that, that you get what you need. Um, and that's much more significant than just everybody getting the same, the same thing. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to take a quick second before we go on. We, we don't have a whole lot more time, but I want to acknowledge Dr. Scott Edgar, who's uh, in the background this evening, our director of research and practice, uh, working on the chat for us. But he, he does a lot of great work, and I just want to acknowledge what he's doing in his role. So thank you, Scott. All right. So we got literally about two minutes um, I'm going to ask one more question. I hope you guys both can respond, I guess, succinctly. In what, in what ways do you see even community agreements being able to support vitality in a classroom? That is community agreements that we all make to ourselves as a community in a class, both the adult, adult or more than one adult and the students. I think you relate it to the music. You relate it to the music. I mean, we, we preach and teach ensemble. And what's more, what's more community than ensemble? And if you can parallel those, those similarities between how we successfully navigate this, this realm between noise and music, and you correlate that back to, hey, right now, things are kind of noisy. Hey, let's turn down the noise. Let's discover the sound. Let's get back to being sound. I think if you draw those parallels, uh, children, children are incredibly bright. They can understand that what's good in one realm also has value in another realm, but it's our job to bridge those gaps and to show them how these things are connected and how there's more that brings us together than separates us. I think that um, having some conversations about the things that we share in common, uh, the goals that we want to achieve in common, but particularly I think in, in, in ensemble situations, but even in a general music classroom, a lot of this has a tendency to come up when it the time comes for making making rules, class rules. But I know a lot of times in in teacher education, we emphasize the students, our, our uh, uh, pre service teachers. It's much better to come together with rules about how we want our environments to be if if it's something that we all do together, rather than the teacher coming in and saying these are my rules. But that when when students are uh, students will be more vested in creating the kind of environment they want when they have an opportunity to have input and to talk about, you know, it's really more it's it's really much more than just uh, regulating behavior. It's what kind of learning environment do we want to have? What kind of learning community do we want to have? And that has a lot to do. It's so much about that relationship piece. Um, it's really difficult to teach a child you don't have a relationship with, to teach a student you don't have. A, I, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's very, it's, it's a lot easier to do it when you have a relationship with them and creating that, that um, type of learning environment where um, students feel seen, they feel safe, and they feel that you have their back no matter what, um, that you are there to help them and that you are there to do everything in your power to ensure that they will be successful. Understanding that they, you know, they have a part in this too. It's not just all on you as the instructor, but they, they also are, they have a, a, a vested interest 
in creating this this type of environment. I think that makes a, a big difference. All right. Thank you both so much. You are both brilliant educators and you, you've shown that tonight. I know we didn't have a ton of time, but I want to just give gratitude for what you shared with us. Um, and thank you so much for your care and attention to this important work. Um, I now invite Rebecca to share some closing remarks from Save the Music and bid everyone good night. Great, thank you, Dr. Yarell Lashley, Dr. Connie McCoy, and Mickey Smith Jr. for a wonderful discussion and sharing your stories and expertise, thank you. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you again to the KKR COVID Response Fund for their generous support of this series. Thank you all for being here and good night.